Good afternoon. My name is Christine Y. Kim, and um, I want to thank you all for the invitation. I'm so thrilled about um, this exhibition. I know it's the end of an extraordinary run during a very difficult time. And I thank um, Rue, Adam, Scott, Megan, and, and everyone here at the Whitney um, for doing such an incredible job, both with the exhibition and the convening today. Um, before I introduce these speakers, I just wanted to start with um, a little something specifically from the catalog, which I just learned this morning is sold out, which we have to do something about, but is very exciting. Um, to, that kind of connects some of the ideas that, um, that were discussed in this, um, in this group that just left the stage, and the three artists, or the three practitioners that I'll be introducing in just a moment. One of the, I'm sure, many brilliant things on the computer of the amazing Okwe and Wezor when he died in the spring of 2019 was an essay that he was going to be contributing to the catalog, but he was never able to finish. And um, in this essay, he was connecting some dots around the violence of the colonial sublime. And um, really what, what kind of, I mean, we never got to read the essay and didn't get to finish it, but in these discussions over time, it was really about connecting um, uh, American painting, Hudson River School, uh, westward expansionism, manifest destiny, the annihilation of um, indigenous bodies, people, cultures, um, the enslavement of Africans in this country, and, and many registers uh, of concurrent violences occurring at the time, and yet this kind of sublime that we see in, in painting um, of this era. Um, with uh, abstraction, in particular, Julie's work, and to be even more specific, oh, the slide is already up, a Hal Eon 1 and 2 from 2017 uh, at SF MoMA, which is, we can pull the, the slide up right now. Um, and specifically in this painting, there's just so much embedded in this. Um, Julie was looking at paintings of um, church, coal, Bierstadt, uh, some of the grids that you see sort of best, I think, in the lower left-hand corner of the, uh, the image on the left, pixelation from digital images relating to San Francisco Bay Area counterculture, protest culture, um, Silicon Valley, Gold Rush, uh, the Pacific Coast, and so many other images, but of course, in Julie's signature way of kind of compression, of embedding, of erasure, um, using drawing uh, as well as kind of loose, bold gestures, and sort of all within there so that the abstraction itself becomes elevated to a place where within the, the DNA of the original photographs or um, kind of both epistemological as well as ontological as well as metaph metaphysical kind of aspects of these, of these histories, of these moments sort of within the, these paintings. Um, and I'm just gonna read a, um, a short uh, passage and paraphrase a short passage from um, one of my four sections of the, the essay in four parts that I contributed to the catalog. Um, really thinking about kind of dematerialization, rematerialization between histories, technologies, um, and the conjoined genealogies of chaos, exploitation, and uh, hope in the making of the American West. Um, which actually that comes out of, of SF MoMA's language. That was a quote right there. So in my essay I write, film and media theorist Vivian Sobchak asserts that our objective encounters with photographic, cinematic, televisual, online, and network technologies have, quote, constituted a radical alteration of the forms of our culture's temporal and spatial consciousness and of our bodily sense of existential presence to the world, to ourselves and to others, end quote. Maratou's paintings from 2016 to the present respond with an intensified bodily sense of presence, perhaps heightened by the steady streams of images dominating news and social media feeds. The Standing Rock and Dakota Pipeline protests, the aftermath of the Orlando nightclub shooting, uh, toddler Alan, Cur Alan Curdy dead on the beach in Kos in the midst of the Syrian refugee crisis, California wildflowers, the Egyptian revolution, and the Arab Spring. Her work reveals a deeper interrogation of both explicit and implicit bodies in source images, her own body as the maker of objects containing bodies and that of the viewer, 
singular and multiple, present and future, analog and electronic. Quote, insofar as our senses are not only sensible but also make sense, writes Vivian Sobchak, the perceiving and sensible body is also always a, a lived body, immersed in making and responding to social as well as somatic meaning, end quote. Meritu's paintings, precarious and provocative, violent and visceral, reflect our senses at the corporeal level of what technology philosopher Don Eide calls micro-perceptions and also through their manifest represent representational function by which they engage our senses consciously and textually at the hermeneutic level of our macro-perception in multiple social, perceptual, and psychological ways. Um, this group of uh, presenters um, will, were asked to uh, do, uh, prepare short presentations around the topic of digital subjectivities. Our first speaker will be Kevin Beasley. Kevin is an artist working in the media of sculpture, performance, art, installation, sound, and video. He earned his BFA in painting and sculpture from the College of Creative Studies in Detroit and MFA from Yale. In 2012, his solo exhibitions have been featured at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, Hammer Projects, LA, and here at the Whitney Museum of American Art. His work is held in public collections around the country, such as Art Institute of Chicago, MoMA, Tate Modern, um, so on and so forth, um, many collections. American Artists is an interdisciplinary artist whose work considers black labor and visibility, as well as anti-blackness within networked life and digital systems, beginning with their legal name change in 2013. Artist is a resident of Red Bull Arts Detroit, a recipient of the Queens Museum Jerome Foundation Fellowship, and a former resident of iBeam Pioneer Works in the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program, and will be coming into our art and technology program at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which I'm very excited about, work around labor and Octavia Butler and um, science and technology. Um, they have exhibited uh, in many museums, including the Whitney, the Studio Museum in Harlem, MCA Chicago, and others. Legacy Russell is a curator, writer, and artist. Um, she is associate curator of exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem, and I'll stop right there to mention, this is really kind of where so much of this started. Um, I started it in 2000, the Studio Museum. Julie came, and thank you. I, you just have to say that, right, Ru? <laughs> Julie came in as an artist in residence in 2001. Uh, the year of 9-11, uh, I mean, just a transformative time historically as well as in Harlem. And Rue came on, I can't, was it 2005? Um, and, you know, I was just looking at the screen over there and there's flashes of D Dave McKenzie and it's making me think of, of freestyle and all these extraordinary moments that, that we've experienced together. But anyway, back to Legacy. She's um, associate curator and the incoming, this is very exciting, executive director and chief curator at The Kitchen. Congratulations, Legacy. Her academic curatorial and creative work focuses on gender, performance, digital selfdom, internet idolatry, and new media ritual. Uh, Russell previously held fellowships at Creative Time, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Met. Her written work, interviews, and essays have been published internationally, and she is a recipient of the Thoma Foundation 2019 Arts Writing Award in Digital Art, a 2020 Rauschenberg Residency Fellow and a recipient of the 2021 Creative Capital Award. So please come to the stage, Legacy American and Kevin. You want to have a seat? And I'll hand this off to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here. Julie, Christine, Rue, the Whitney, everyone. Um, yeah, it's great to, to be here to participate and to contribute. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna jump in. Um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, the, the kind of materiality that drives the work and that drives the way that we develop meaning. Um, and thinking really, you know, specifically for me, I work very tactily. The work is centered around uh, building a methodology in the studio that allows me to process the world and to process the things that I'm experiencing. So that leaves it wide open in terms of what that possibility is, the kinds of spaces that the work exists in, and you know, for the, the subject matter, thinking analog and digitally as being synonymous and simultaneous 
and those spaces are one that we're constantly thinking about and considering. So as a, um, I guess as a, uh, as a starter, the work that, that I've been doing for maybe the past five years has been really involved in dealing with cotton as a material. Um, and maybe even longer, maybe since like 2011, that's like 10 years, um, really trying to process um, the legacy of, of agriculture, the legacy of um, uh, oppression, subjugation, labor, um, all of these things that are kind of roped into the, the physical experience of a material and of uh, an, an agricultural byproduct, something that we live off of and that we, uh, we allow into our lives in so many ways. Um, so the work is really a way for me to take uh, a, a, a process of mark making and think about a transfer of the soul. How a, a mark is the sort of beginning and then the resultant over hundreds of years, thousands of years, is, is the soul, something that remains, something that still holds a certain kind of potency. And for me, points to a level of abstraction that I think that in a lot of ways, we're still not able to grasp. Um, it's something that's constantly moving and transitioning. So um, I guess this is the, is this the pointer here? So thinking materially about where these things meet, physically, the process of labor, putting these, these objects together, um, investing in even their, their fastening, and then thinking about where they kind of transcend to or where they kind of move to and how they could kind of transfer um, an experience of, of black life specifically. And I think this can be key to think about how materials can have affect, um, which is also really important in uh, considering how we develop meaning around these things because they are multi-generational. So on a flip side, I'm not gonna, cons I'm not gonna go into this too much because this is a, a really big project. Um, but I've been wanting to think about um, or at least kind of point out uh, a certain aspect of this installation, uh, a view of a landscape, a cotton gin motor that was realized here at the Whitney in 2018. Um, and thinking about how this materiality really transfers through multiple spaces. Um, and does this simultaneously to deliver um, an experience that could be, uh, that, that, that could, I don't know, uh, be a, um, a byproduct of what the soul embodies. Um, so this work, uh, the motor is actually operating, it's running, it's driving um, during the, the, the whole uh, run of the exhibition. And it's captured by microphones, which are an analog process um, in terms of sound capture. And the chamber is uh, acoustically sealed, so there's no sound that escapes. And so you have a space inside that's being captured by these microphones. And what you see the three cables here, um, those cables point uh, head to you have the, the, the thick cable is um, the power cable for the motor itself. It just required so much power to draw from the museum itself. And the second cable is power for an interface, an audio interface that sits on the roof. And the audio interface is a um, analog to digital, digital to analog conversion, converter. And what it does is it takes all of the audio from the interior and uh, processes it into one ethernet cable, CAT6, which is the third cable that runs through the museum inner workings 
And then, can you see that? It's like, it looks dark for me. Um, into the listening room on the other side. And this listening room is another realization of, of the, the sort of result of that sonic composition uh, acoustically realized. And what happens is then that Cat6 cable runs into, or that Ethernet cable runs to the mixer and to the amplif amplification system along with uh, an Ethernet switch that then allows for that sound to be dispersed and spread out. Um, and you can really do anything with it. It's a protocol called Dante that allows you to hold all of that audio into a digital Ethernet space, um, virtual space, and route and manipulate any way that you want possible. And for this installation, it was important that it was then brought back into an analog, um, an analog space. And that's where the modular synth comes into play, which also has digital processing. So there's a constant back and forth between both, um, both of these spaces, analog and digital, and there's a lot of play. And the intention was to be able to physically move the sound in ways that maybe I wouldn't have been if I had just mic'd the, the motor on its own and then brought back through the speaker system. And then there's one other work that I was thinking about that's actually an older work from 2012 called I Want My Spot Back. Um, and I've never really talked about this aspect of this work. Um, it's, um, so it's a, it's basically it's, a uh, performance of 39 digital files that are processed, um, that, that are made up of um, acapellas from dead and deceased rappers from early to mid 90s. And it's all performed actually digitally, but using the tools of, um, you know, from like the 70s, which are these Technics uh, 1200s. Um, and that's done and made possible with uh, time-coded vinyl, which was something that was popping up, uh, I would say, 2008, 2009, roughly. Um, and it was a technology that, and still is, but isn't really used that often, that inscribes a signal on a turntable that then is also read by the needle and an interface. And the interface reads that code and communicates that to software in a laptop in order to be able to determine time, where the needle is on the actual vinyl. So it, it gives you the kind of sensibility and the physical connection, but allows you to manipulate digital files. And given that a lot of the music that I was sourcing um, was originally produced, and most of these rappers didn't really experience their work in the digital world, thinking about how that translation or how that, maybe not translation, maybe more um, how that transition from, uh, from a, different, a different time period or a different space into another space allows for maybe another deeper connection to the soul. Um, and yeah, I actually think I'm gonna end it there. So, I want to thank Julie and Megan for the invitation. And yeah, I'm really honored to be here and, and be with friends, uh, Kevin and Legacy, and to see Christine again. And I, I, I want to try and approach this subject matter of digital subjectivities, black queer abstract, which is many different things, but I'm going to try and bring those all together. Um, and I thought I would take this opportunity to kind of tease out this idea that I've, I've had in the back of my mind for a while, um, kind of building off of this essay from Glenn Ligon and trying to tie that into some of the the concerns that really animate a lot of the work that I create. So it's this is a, a little bit of theory with a couple art images at the end. 
So in the 2004 essay, Black Light on David Hammonds and the Poetics of Emptiness, Glenn Ligon describes this work, uh, which is David Hammonds' Concerto in Black and Blue. And this was a work from 2002, which essentially there was this vast empty gallery and people who went to the gallery had these little blue flashlights that they would go around the room and um, they would illuminate what they could. Otherwise, the space was essentially just dark. For Ligon, Concerto in Black and Blue represents a more than decade-long journey in which Hammonds attempts to get free. Beyond representation and materiality, a radical dematerialization. What would it mean for a work made of only light to be very black? As a precedent to this work, Ligon cites a 1993 interview with Hammonds in which Hammonds says, Terrell, he's on a different wavelength. He's got a completely different vision, different than mine, but it's beautiful to see people who have a vision that has nothing to do with presentation in a gallery. I wish I could make art like that, but we're too oppressed for me to be dabbling out there. I would love to do that because that also could be very black. You know, as a black artist dealing just with light, they would say, how in the hell could he deal with that coming from where he did? I want to get to that. I'm trying to get to that, but I'm not free enough yet. I still feel I have to get my message out. Um, you may recognize this image from Stephen Nelson's presentation, but I, I also really liked um, this painting of Julie's. And so also in the essay, Ligon suggests that Julie Maritou's work is being in conversation with this means of abstraction uh, that Hammonds is after. Julie figures the body as a collection of networks, and this is Ligon speaking. She creates canvases full of incident, records of memories, places, historical events, time, symbols, at once exploded and collapsed on themselves. Dynamic, spiraling in and out of control, nonsensical and coherent. They're a visual equivalent of Borges' Library of Babel, except in this library, the books are on tape and all talking to you at once. Meritu's paintings are neural maps, flow charts describing the processes by which what is exterior becomes interior and vice versa. They're representations of the dizzying simultaneity of, and juxtaposition that characterizes this particular moment. The dyma dynamic modality of Meritu's paintings subverts a visual language of networks often grounded in moments such as this. And uh, this is a video clip from this event known as the Mother of All Demos, um, which took place in 1968. And it's essentially this event where this man gives this demonstration of the first computer that used a clickable mouse and interface. And it was also um, using Ethernet to project the event to multiple institutions, though it, it took place at Stanford University. And so we see a lot of that uh, visual network language come across and also this sort of um, assertion of the white, white cishet male um, as a sort of pioneer of technological space. And it was through this shift in technology, um, the use of the computer in this way, being able to click in, on the interface, um, that the physical quality of the computer became obfuscated. So a lot of the internal processes then start to disappear. You just really see the screen. Your experience with the computer became distilled to only what you perceive on a screen. The events and circumstances that define your position in virtual space become abstracted by textual characters, a computer cursor, and a flashing white interface. The similarity between Doug Engelbart, the man in this video, uh, his use of networks, and James Terrell's use of light, which Hammonds finds compelling, is that there is no uh, move towards lightness, as Ligon describes it. There's no move toward lightness for bodies that have never had weight. Terrell and Engelbart are expressing an agency conferred to them by centuries of looting. And so this is a sculpture of mine called The Black Critique, 
parentheses, towards the wild beyond. And so in this work, through, through the use of blue light, I wanted to get towards a black interface, trying to relocate a black interface within the computer that was once inherent to the screen. And to give you some context to what the sculpture is, um, it's a bit like a, a vitrine. It's this metal container which has these smartphones laying in a row. Um, and on each of them, there's a black interface that sort of reads out these different descriptive texts from authors that are speculating on what black space means. And this is a detail of that sculpture. Before Doug Engelbart's demonstration, computer monitors appeared solid black, upon which lines of code were input in green or white characters. Within the next few years, the negative space of the computer screen began to appear white, replacing the black command line interface used on computers prior to that. New computers offered users a backdrop of white space reminiscent of blank paper sheets. So what I attempted to do in the sculpture was to get to that black space within the computer. What could the potentials of that be um, in a contemporary time period? And thinking of these notions of uh, networked life and thinking of an originary blackness within the screen um, really influence, um, all right, well, basically, you can see a, a demonstration of this work. And this was an online intervention on the Whitney Museum's website called Looted. That was the title of the work, where all of the images on the website were boarded up with plywood. And um, this is a work that debuted um, the summer of 2020, so during the height of the protests in response to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I, I wanted to think about this sort of ability to reclaim space and sort of what possibilities could occur within virtual networks that maybe could allude to what possibilities are, are possible in real life. The methods of abstraction used by Hammonds and Meritu, uh, what can be called a move towards lightness, is particularly useful in the face of virtual infrastructures that operate with a high level of obfuscation. Inequity is coded into our lives and carried out by software and algorithms, recreating the historical imperatives of social reality. In my work, I seek to indict networked life, its promise of agency, and to reveal our own reality. Thank you. So I'm going to um, quickly say a few things to give some context. But what I think is really funny is that um, as I was preparing for today, I was kind of reflecting on the experience of what it was like to first be inside of this incredible historic exhibition um, that our dear friends and colleagues have created collectively with Julie. And um, I think it was really funny because at the time I was wearing a mask, obviously in the galleries, and I, I think I you know, went through multiple rooms probably screaming through my mask, thinking that I was speaking very softly, just saying, oh God. Um, and, you know, and probably goddamn, too. Um, and so what was amazing was that as I walked through this space, I really thought about the fact that this really was what a unified global struggle looks like. Um, and I realized as well that, like, as I left, right, I had not only been kind of exclaiming out loud, but probably also kind of praying, too, that perhaps aspects of my own life's work and the work of these amazing folks here, thinking about black data, very much so redefining it, um, rearticulating it, um, really was writing towards the delivery into this exhibition, the possibility that it can even uh, exist at all. Um, and that, you know, what Julie and Rue and Christine have really done here is something so exceptional because it speaks to the longer arc of what Studio Museum um, is all about, right? That actually, you know, blackness and queerness and black queer data um, has existed from City Museum's inception. Um, and, you know, very much so the people who have built that, built it out of the impossibilities of what that redefinition um, could even be. So, you know, as I, I chatted a little bit with Julie afterwards, I kind of exchanged some messages with her and I said, you know, wow, like the, the possibility of even being able to write or think about your work, right? Like it, it's such an um, expansive and cosmic thing to reach toward. 
And because of that, I made this video essay, which probably kind of, um, you know, is a, a sort of version of what was going through my head in addition to, oh God, so I'll let it play now. David Turnbull, in his 1989 book, Maps Are Territories, writes, Maps raise and shed light on a number of fundamental questions about how humans see and depict the natural world. He asks, what are maps and what is their function? What is the difference between a map and a picture? What is the relationship of the map to the landscape it represents? How do you read a map? The map-territory relation, often called upon in the practice of map making or cartography, describes the relationship between an object and a representation of that object. As in, for example, the relation between a geographical territory and a map of it. The late Polish-American scientist and philosopher Alfred Korzybski once famously remarked that the map is not the territory and that the word is not the thing, encapsulating his view that an abstraction derived from something or a reaction to it is not the thing itself. Extending this logic, what's being proposed is that perhaps abstraction itself is a lie, that it can never be a complete or whole representation of the thing of origin. I disagree. What if the abstraction is the necessary reset, a correction to a way of seeing that shows us new forms of truth. Is it not our responsibility then to queer, black, glitch, and break the broken image, to give way to new territories and new visions of a radical diaspora? Catherine McKittrick, in her Demonic Grounds, Black Women and the Cartographies of Struggle, asks, what is at stake in the legacy of exploration, conquest, and stable vantage points if we insist that past and present geographies are connective sites of struggle, which have always called into question the very appearance of safely secure and unwavering locations? And what do black women's geographies make possible if they are not conceptualized as subordinate buried or lost, but rather indicative of an unresolved story. What if the abstraction of the thing is the thing? Making and unmaking space as a commitment to abstraction the thing that Julie shows us with her work is therefore a way to come closer to the truth of our stories, the ways we've had to move across black water, through black space, into the futurity of black imagination. Radical cartography does the necessary breaking that helps us remember. Maps are not neutral guides. Those who create maps choose what to include and exclude and how to display information. Maps are ways of deciding the territory, and the territory we are taught and told is raced, classed, and gendered. The practice of counter cartography, and the production of counter maps refuse the ever complex and troubling construct of manifest destiny, most particularly as it intersects with the legacy of landscape painting and who has been given the privilege of doing this work of spatial documentation and data collection.
counter maps reject the assumption of neutrality in the maps we're schooled to use. Instead, they ask us to reconsider hidden narratives and produce an alternative history by highlighting the experiences of historically oppressed peoples. If maps aren't made for us, how do we create a new topography, one that shapes our own way and helps us wayfind through our own storytelling? Counter maps look like this, where hair braiding for enslaved black people became a mode of wayfinding toward liberation. Or like this work, Stereo Styles by Lorna Simpson from 1988, where she shows us new ways of representing a black femhood with range. Counter maps look like modernist data portraits that W.E.B. Du Bois debuted for the first time at the Paris Exposition in 1900. Or like this work, Attica by Faith Ringgold, created in 1972. Counter maps are Catwalk by Rashad Newsom. This work created in 2016 that shows us how we might vogue across the ballroom floor. Or sounds like Alice Smith. <laughs> That means radical cartographers counter mapping looks like Ed Clark with his broom or the world's Jacoby Satterwhite creates, as we see here in his 2020 work, Black Luncheon. Or the reclamation of space and centering of blackness as the primary image, staged here by the incredible Lorraine O'Grady as part of her work, Art Is, in Harlem in 1983. Make maps black again. Make maps queer again. Make our queer black maps abstract again.
first, I just want to say this is not designed to be a, a, you know, I'm not moderating a panel where I'm asking them questions, but really we just kind of want to have a conversation in some of the ideas that have been brought up or reintroduced um, um, in, in the past 30 minutes. And one of the things I just want to throw out there is going back to what Stephen Nelson was saying earlier about his thinking about in Julie's work, the kind of like unmaking, is that what it was, world unmaking, as opposed to Julie's kind of making. Um, I sort of think about, I mean, not to, to focus too much on the binary of those two and think more about kind of all of that space in between. Um, something that I think uh, applies to each of your practices and your thinking is, and I think specifically in American that you said there's this kind of the anti-blackness in, um, in AIs, in algor algorithms, in kind of big data and how that get, big data gets processed. So really within these processes of uh, dematerialization, rematerialization, so on and so forth, maybe if I just want to throw that out there and whoever wants to respond to that kind of thinking in, in, in that space and in that process and, and, and legacy, you're thinking about kind of, you know, black liberatory space within all of this, kind of how do we, how do we talk about that? How do we deal with that? Yeah, I don't know, can you hear me okay through this? Okay. Um, yeah, I love that idea of, of world unmaking and I think also um, about this kind of notion of dematerialization that I was pushing toward and, and that I guess could be used either way, both in the way that obfuscation can be used as a means of oppression, especially like in, in virtual space and dealing with obfuscated technologies, but also I think um, in these ways of thinking about abstract work, thinking of that means of R removal as a as a another strategy to sort of you know deal with that or contend with that and also I guess um, make space or, or make a claim on behalf of what our identities and our needs represent. I mean, I guess like to the point of kind of this idea of like emancipatory space, liberatory space. I'm like you know certainly thinking deeply about as well, the fact that there is no singular black data um, and that that, you know, for me is something that continues to be um, a kind of mantra to come back to and especially thinking deeply about the work of both Kevin and American too, the ways that these are things that are constantly in remix and transformation and, you know, at the word remix came up earlier today as Ju Julie was speaking and I was thinking deeply too about just the kind of chopping and screwing of what the work is supposed to be, right? The fact that actually a lot of what this practice is is about um, renegotiating space in addition to sound and so um, for me seeing that so much within what this exhibition is, right? What the, the kind of career is of, of what Julie has done in building obviously the community alongside of the practice and you know the unique intervention that is made possible by that. Yeah, I would, I would say too also it's like, it's the trajectory and the kind of goals or maybe it's not goals as much as it's, it's like where do these things land or where do they surface in a lot of ways? So you, you know, you're able to to really bear witness to the unfolding of, of a lot of these ideas. Um, and yeah, I, I just like first, I just like kept thinking about black Twitter in a lot of ways, just, you know, as a location, but also as something that is constantly evolving and moving in so many different ways. And I think it's also like, you know, it's like, where is black Twitter? It's, become, it's an ontological <laughs> site. You know, yeah, it's it's like, <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you have a part, this is work, um, in your installation here at the Whitney, which I didn't see, but I, I've seen videos of it and this kind of extraordinary like re removal, right? And then reinsertion, but through a, a reconfigured, restructured physical visceral realm where the object itself, the cotton gin, is an extremely loud, you know, take space, you know, the, the violence. I mean, there's just so much in that and then kind of dividing and, and separating. Maybe, can you, does that relate to your, to your, to that installation or your work or your kind of thinking about making? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there, there are some people who are like, I didn't see the motor or they're like, I didn't see the listening room or there, there's something about the, that very deliberate 
um, separation or even extraction, um, transitioning, that I think uh, it, it, it requires a, a, a very like sort of physical activation or physical engagement, but then also a, a really kind of um, mental, intellectual one in order to, to really understand uh, the consequences of things like that. I mean, and, and I think that that parallels to a kind of level of violence that also exists within separating and also, uh, yeah, just historically. I mean, it's, it's really big for me to even, to try to encapsulate um, all of it as much as it's really trying to, to process all of its parts. So really the work I think is, is stemmed around trying to pull things apart in, in a very deliberate way. Yeah, I want to I want to say I really love that exhibition also for the way that you've taken this extremely loaded object and and sort of subverted it or, or used it to challenge what it's meant to represent and thinking of this um, notion of counter mapping that that legacy mentioned and just thinking and also about um, um, manifest destiny that was in your presentation and I feel like manifest destiny you know, imbues so much of what it is we're contending with and just thinking of um, ways of, of responding to that, but also sort of, I guess, wielding the same amount of um, control and deliberation, but, but yeah, towards another intention. And I think like what's really interesting about the history of landscapes painting um, and kind of like the Hudson School and the ways in which people kind of romanticize this is often, you know, they're kind of looking at it from this aesthetic perspective, you know, and, and finding it peaceful. And, you know, you kind of, the, the benches are always in those rooms, right? Where I think that, you know, what is remarkable about when we think about this idea of counter mapping and as well too, like kind of turning inside out some of those um, journeys is that, you know, thinking about the people that were traveling through those spaces, right? And so those images become so much more complex when you think about like quite literally what journeying had to occur um, and for whom. And so, you know, I'm really excited about this idea of the ways that those things can kind of be broken open and, and as well that those pathways can be made more visible, which I see so much within obviously this incredible um, body of painting too that Julie has created because, you know, that that motion, that movement, right, um, certainly is something that has been rendered invisible across a whole history. Um, and, you know, I appreciated too that, you know, uh, Roth Rothko and Malovich came up earlier because that is a, another example, right, of what happens um, in moments where aspects of these things are, can, are not turned inside out, right, um, or are not kind of um, decoded. And that, you know, that that question of what is um, rendered legible versus not, right, um, is really something that needs to remain dynamic dynamic and complicated. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I wanted to continue with that legacy, but maybe connect it to you came up, coming up, came out with an incredible book called Glitch Feminism a couple of years ago. And um, maybe for, for the audience and, and people who have not read this book, I highly recommend it. How does that tie in? What is, what is the kind of the glitch about, and, and do, or does it? Maybe I will say it came out last year, but I feel like I've lived <laughs> several years. The discriticity so of no, all of I just, I'm just saying it's like really interesting about space and time. But um, yeah, I mean, to the point of, of um, thinking about the glitch, I mean, I am really excited in my practice about this idea of what disruption can look like. And I, I appreciate, too, that this is something that Kevin and American in their own right like have explored with a lot of care. Um, what does it look like to break what's broken and have things um, be you know, both an intervention and opportunity to kind of reconvene or recongregate around what that breaking is? So you know, for me, as I um, think so much about you know, what Julie's work is, this kind of mapping of data, this counter cartography that really the glitch is about exposing some of those seams and allowing that um, sort of re-navigation and, and kind of um, re-approach to algorithmic practice, what does black queer data even look like, um, to be expanded and redefined. Thank you, Legacy, American, and Kevin.